Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. This episode is called Solar Energy Fundamentals Part 4. We're going to learn about shading. Solar PV shading can be worse than you think since solar cells are connected in series. We will cover the Solmetric Sun-Eye shading device. By the way, note that Vivint Solar was bought by Sunrun since the recording of this podcast. We will talk about the Solar Pathfinder and we will cover some software that can digest shading information such as Aurora Solar, Helioscope, Energy Toolbase, PV Syst, Albedo, SketchUp, Skellion, PVCAD, AutoCAD, and more. And then we will talk about single axis trackers, concentrated PV, and seasonal tilting. And remember to learn more about solar and classes and see flashcards. And just to be so solar smart, go to solarsean.com. On with the show. Let's talk about shading. Shading is something that we try to avoid with solar systems especially because we have solar cells at least and a lot of times strings that are connected together in series. With series connections, shading is not always proportional. That means that you could perhaps shade 10% of a module and lose all of that module's production. It depends on the module. It can get kind of advanced in the explanation. So what we're doing here is figuring out how cutting down a tree would improve our solar access. Isn't that what we want to do? Cut down more trees for solar. Hey, save the planet, right? It's funny to me that sometimes your inverters will tell you how many trees you saved by installing a solar system because instead of using fossil fuels, somebody was using solar energy. So actually there is a math equation where you can save a bunch of trees by cutting down a tree so your solar system makes more energy. And this just really means that photovoltaics is more efficient than photosynthesis. Trees take CO2 out of the atmosphere and turn them into biomass. Fossil fuels burn old biomass and PV prevents fossil fuels from being burned. Go figure. Another neat thing about the Solmetric is with the GPS, you can take all of these pictures and it makes a Google Earth file. And then you can open it on Google Earth and it'll tell you where you were standing. A lot of times what happens is people go do all these site surveys and they thought they were going to remember where they were and then they don't have a clue. It's also recommended to write down where you took each picture, but this is a really neat option to have, telling you where you were standing. The Solmetric also makes a nice shading report that you can show your customers. One thing that happened with Solmetric a number of years ago is they got bought up by Vivint Solar. Vivint Solar is one of the top residential solar installers in the United States. Vivint Solar took the Solmetric off the market for a while, so most of their competitors had to scramble and they figured out ways to calculate shading without the Solmetric. Some people think it might have been revenge. Not too long before, Solar City which is now Tesla, was the number one residential installer in the United States, and they bought Zep, which was a railless racking company. Vivint was exclusively using Zep, and then all of a sudden they couldn't use it anymore because SolarCity bought Zep for $158 million. I wish I would have came up with that idea. So then Vivint comes along and buys Solmetric, and now SolarCity can't use it for a couple of years. So in the meantime, everybody figured out a different way of doing it. Then Vivint put the Solmetric back on the market, but it's not used widely like it used to be. It used to be that you had to have one of these things if you were getting financing for residential solar. So a lot of the big companies have their own proprietary shade analysis software. But if you have your own company, you might be using something like Aurora Solar if you're doing residential solar for shading. They do something that people like that's kind of neat called LiDAR. They use lasers to figure out shading. There's different places that there's LiDAR coverage. They had to have an airplane fly over with a laser in the different places. So you can see that it's a lot of the urban areas, places where a lot of the rooftop solar is, in the United States. So that was Aurora Solar. LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It uses a pulsed laser to measure ranges. Now we're gonna talk about Helioscope. Helioscope is a competitor of Aurora. Aurora is more known for smaller systems, such as residential solar. Helioscope is more famous for commercial buildings and perhaps ground-mounted solar. Helioscope, you can also use LiDAR 
A lot of times what people do though, is they just draw the shading object. So if you're on a commercial rooftop, they might be drawing an air conditioner up there, which is pretty much a cube. Helioscope will also work with Energy Toolbase. Energy Toolbase is known for working with energy storage. So if you have a system with energy storage, you might want to look into Energy Toolbase. Energy Toolbase is also famous for analyzing data from many different utilities. There's so many different rate structures, time of use rates, tiered rates, and so many different utilities, thousands of them, that it's hard to keep track of. So if you want to figure out, will it pay to have an energy storage system? What size energy storage system, etc., You might want to be looking at Energy Toolbase. Energy Toolbase doesn't just work with Helioscope. It works alone and it works with other software too. So if you're interested in this, I'd recommend going to their website and checking out all the things that they can do. But if you want to play with the big boys, I'm talking multi-megawatts, it's almost required that you have to use PVSYST for the banks to invest in these large projects. We're not talking rooftop here. We're talking big projects. However, PVSYST can do rooftop, but that's not what it's known for. They have simple drawings and they have output data that is super analyzed. Plus, they've just been around for a long time, so the banks are used to it. Even if you came up with software that was better than PVSYST, it would be very difficult to get people to use your software. Independent company called Albedo, remember that means reflection, and what they're doing is they're doing PVSYST for you because it can be difficult to use. So there's different companies that you can hire to do the PVSYST analysis. And as I was saying, Purchasing and financing entities such as banks, utilities, and private power purchase agreement stakeholders often require PVSYST modeling as a critical part of ongoing negotiations. And the best way to learn about software is from the software company. So PVSYST does training in Geneva, Switzerland. What a great excuse to go to Europe. Their price is about $2,300 for four days. That means a Swiss franc is pretty much about a dollar. So how are you gonna render your project? How are you going to design it? How are you going to make electrical drawings? There's different kinds of CAD programs. CAD means computer assisted drawing. SketchUp is kind of famous. It used to be made by Google. However, Google sold it to a company called Trimble quite a while ago. They have free versions. They have paid versions. You can learn it on YouTube, but it does have a learning curve. They have a warehouse where you can pull out a solar array and change it. Solar modules, solar inverters, wires, conduit, junction boxes. You can get as detailed as you want with these CAD drawings. And then we have a company called Skellion, which is a plug-in for SketchUp. That means it works with SketchUp. You pay them and it does extra stuff. And it's made just for PV that it works with SketchUp, Google Earth, PVGIS, PVSYST, and PVWatts. CAD program that's only for PV. It's called PVCAD made by PV Complete. Funny thing is, is when I was learning AutoCAD about 12 years ago, I purchased PVCAD.com. So if you want to find out about PVCAD, you have to go to PVComplete.com and they make a CAD program that's specifically for solar and they're cool. They're in Oakland. Now the industry standard for all drawing, for all architects, for big projects is called AutoCAD. If you're big time, you're using AutoCAD. It's made by Autodesk. And the people that do this can have a whole career at it. So if you wanted to get into drafting, learn about AutoCAD. Most community colleges have AutoCAD courses. It's a good thing to know. So all of this software, what's the best way to learn how to use the software? From the software company, or maybe a community college course if it's something that's so big time like AutoCAD. But especially the solar design software, it's really good to learn from the company because they have every incentive in the world to get you hooked on their software. There's a big learning curve for all these different softwares. So it's not like you're gonna just learn one and then switch all the time. And who knows the software better than the people that make the software? Most software companies have free training. It was just PVSYST where you have to pay a whole bunch of francs. And if you want somebody to do layouts and permit packages for you, there's a number of different companies that make solar permits. It's pretty easy just to go out there and do a search for solar permit companies. Let's talk about the solar energy fundamentals of a single axis tracker. It's a horizontal axis. It points at the sun in the morning. It points in the sun at the afternoon. And at noontime, unless the sun would be straight over your head, it's not pointing at the sun. It's actually flat at noon. 
it can put a whole bunch of PV on one tracker. And when the PV system is big enough, it will pay to do maintenance on a system like this because you will get extra energy. And another reason why utilities and solar energy producers like these types of systems is it doesn't make all the energy just at a big peak at noon. It makes extra energy in the afternoons. Concentrated PV needs to track the sun all the time. We have special lenses and perhaps mirrors inside reflecting and focusing the light onto a super efficient, perhaps gallium arsenide, 30% efficient solar cell. When PV was a lot more expensive, this made more sense, but nobody does this anymore. Concentrated PV needs to focus and aim straight at the light. If you had regular PV and your tracker broke, you'd still be getting production. With concentrated PV, you would very rarely get any production because you need to focus those light beams. Concentrated PV is neat, but it's just not common anymore. Rules of thumb, different ways to point your PV to optimize for different seasons. One of the things that I always thought that was interesting, that the sun paths in the fall and the winter are almost exactly the same and the sun paths in the summer and the spring are almost exactly the same. That's because the shortest day of the year is the first day of winter, and then the days start getting longer. And the longest day of the year is the first day of summer, and the days start getting shorter. Go figure. I think summer is hotter than spring just because Earth has been warmed up for a while. And the same goes with winter being colder than fall because fall has cooled off that part of the Earth for a while. Rules of thumb have to do with how we tilt our modules. For annual tilt, the best production is generally about a latitude tilt, or for most of the continental United States, more of the temperate latitudes throughout the world, 30 degrees is pretty good. It used to be on the associate exam, the right answer was latitude tilt, but then they swapped it out for 30 degrees. So if you see latitude or 30 degrees, that's best for annual production. A lot of times people tilt less than optimal because there's different benefits, such as you can fit more PV and there's less wind uplifting issues. However, for maximum production, from a PV module, latitude tilt or 30 degrees tilt is pretty darn good. To optimize for winter or fall, you would perhaps tilt at latitude plus 15 degrees. So if you were at 30 degrees latitude and you were designing an off-grid system, to optimize for winter, because that's going to be your critical design time, your critical design month is going to be that month with the worst production. So it's really common with an off-grid system, people try to optimize for the worst time of the year, and they will tilt something at latitude plus 15. So if you were at a 30 degree latitude, that would be 30 plus 15. That would be a 45 degree tilt. These rules of thumb do not work everywhere because if you're at the North Pole with a 90 degree latitude, would you really be tilting it 15 degrees towards the ground? Or should I say ice? Now to optimize for summer or spring, they would say to tilt it at latitude minus 15 degrees. So that means if you were at 30 degree latitude minus 15 degree latitude, that would be a 15 degree tilt. If you're putting solar on your roof, you just go with the slope of the roof. When PV was more expensive, people would tilt it up on their roofs now, if you tilted it up on your roof, people would laugh at you. <laughs> I thought this was interesting when I was getting my pilot's license. One degree latitude is about 69 statute miles. That's 111 kilometers, and that would be one nautical mile. Degrees latitude are pretty close to being the same from the North Pole to the South Pole. But longitude degrees are very different as you go further north from the equator. If you're at the North Pole, you could walk 360 degrees latitude in a minute. You would have to approach the speed of light to be able to do that at the equator. Another thing that's interesting is degrees and latitude are divided into minutes. So one minute of latitude is one nautical mile. The Earth also is a little bit wide at the waist because of that spin, so that's why it's not exact. Because did you know that the Earth wasn't round? Don't worry, I'm not trying to start a flat earther conspiracy theory, but I'm just saying as something spins, its waist gets wider, like Saturn's rings. You weigh a little bit less at the equator than you do at the poles because that spin is lifting you up a little bit. We have big solar conferences. SPI, that's also known as Solar Power International. It's sponsored by SIA, who also has different regional conferences. SPI is typically in the fall in the western part of the United States. Lots of people and lots of stuff to see at these big solar conferences. We also have InterSolar US, 
and there's intersolar conferences all around the world. Intersolar US lately has been in California in the winter. Intersolar Germany, which I go to every year, is going to be spring or summer in Munich. Great reason to go see my friends. Then there's the American Solar Energy Society. I'm on the board of directors of a division of ACES called NorCal Solar. ACES is really the oldest solar organization in the world. ACES is also closely related to ISIS. That's the International Solar Energy Society. And yes, they didn't want to change their name because of those bad guys. So they're still called ISIS, but it's I-S-E-S. -E so I'm closely connected to ACES. ACES conferences used to be a lot bigger, but hey, these trade shows compete with each other. They're very competitive. SPI also teams up with SNEC. I'm good friends with the owner of SNEC, and she gets 260,000 people to turn out every year in Shanghai in about May or June. I also teach a national electrical code workshop at SPI at InterSolar. I teach classes at the ACES conference, and I teach a class at the SNEC conference. So you can also go there and take my class. Thanks for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast, the place where you can learn everything there is to know about solar. And if you want to know more than everything, that's more than everybody else, go to solarsean.com.